donating blood, give the gift of life, research on blood thinners, and more on blood and clotting disorders. Funding for this program is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Post captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. <laughs> Welcome to On Call. I'm Tammy Watson. Blood and clotting disorders are what we're going to talk about tonight, and this really opens the door to a lot of issues. Later in our show, you're going to see stories about blood thinning medication and about donating blood. And we're going to be taking and talking about things like strokes and blood clots and anemia and how blood actually works inside our bodies. With me tonight in the studio, ready to lead us in this discussion, are Dr. Cameron Darabi and the on-call medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. They're ready to answer your questions right now, so you can call into our toll-free number. It's probably on the screen already. It's 1-888-DOCTOR-ON-CALL. Again, the phone number for questions about blood and clotting disorders is 1-888-376-6225 helping to answer the phones tonight and take your questions are volunteers from the Brookings Health System. Now, Dr. Hong, before you introduce our guest, give us a snapshot of some of the things that, are, things that you think our viewers will learn about tonight. Well, how dangerous clotting can be, what brings on clotting problems, a little bit about congenital or inherited clotting things. You know, we're talking about blood disorders and what uh, our guest uh, deals with on a daily basis. We're going to also have to talk about leukemias, different kinds of uh, lymphomas, uh, blood disorders of all kinds. There's and so there's just, you know, th this is a very interesting time. I mean, a lot of people are involved with these things. Why do we do blood testing? And uh, what do we learn from blood testing? Okay. We can go anywhere you want with all this. Right. So we look forward to your questions. And now I'm pleased to introduce to you our guest for this evening, Dr. Cameron Darabi. Dr. Darabi specializes in hematology, medical oncology, and transfusion medicine, and he practices at Sanford Hematology and Oncology in Sioux Falls. Thanks for joining us, Cameron. Thank you for having me. Um, as you said, I'm a hematologist, oncologist at Sanford yeah. in Sioux Falls, and um, uh, we see a variety of patients with uh, benign, so non-cancerous blood disorders, as well as pa patients who have uh, blood cancers. So uh, uh, where did you do your training? I, tra I went to medical school in Germany and then trained in internal medicine at, at Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. Yeah. Then I did a hematology, medical oncology fellowship uh, after my internal medicine training at New York Medical College in New York City, and I trained in transfusion medicine at Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts. So, so uh, transfusion medicine is, explain that a little bit to me. That's uh, uh, the specialty that deals with uh, obtaining blood products, uh, managing the blood product supply inside a big hospital like Sanford or Avera or uh, one of the big hospitals in Boston mm -hmm. where I was training at the time and um, also providing support for services such as bone marrow transplantation. Right. All right. 
Well, you know, we've got a wide variety of options for you. We'd love to have your calls. We'll talk more about it right after this. Blood clots can damage the body and lead to serious problems such as stroke, heart attack, kidney failure, deep vein thrombosis, and pulmonary embolism. I'm pretty sure that after tonight's show, it's going to be one where when the credits roll and the lights go down, we sit around on set and say, there's so much more we could have talked about. This is because how blood works in our bodies is such a fascinating and complex process. And one aspect of the process, as Dr. Holm already mentioned, is clotting. If your blood is unable to clot, you bleed and have serious problems. But if your blood clots in the wrong place at the wrong time, that's no good either. Thus, we have need for blood thinning medications. Warfarin is the generic name of what may be the most common blood thinner. You may know some of the brand names of this drug, Coumadin, Jantovin, Marfarin. Recently, a completely new type of blood thinning medication has been approved for use in the United States, and its brand name is Pradoxa. The drug's generic or chemical name is Dabigatren. Regional heart doctors in Rapid City was involved in a large study that scrutinized the effectiveness of Pradoxa as compared to Warfarin, and OnCall went to Rapid City to learn more about it. The RELI clinical drug study looked at the effectiveness of a new type of blood thinning medication and involved over 18,000 patients worldwide. Regional Heart Doctors in Rapid City, South Dakota was the fourth largest test site in America and playing a key role in the study here was Dr. Jose Teixeira. The purpose of the study is, uh, was to evaluate an alternative to a blood thinner that has been around for more than 50 years that's you know, known by the name Coumadin or Warfarin. And Coumadin and Warfarin is very effective in reducing the risk of strokes, but it's hard to manage uh, and interacts with a lot of medication. The research focused on individuals with atrial fibrillation, a type of abnormal heart rhythm that can put patients at greater risk for developing the blood clots that lead to strokes. First of all, why is atrial fibrillation a big deal? You know, atrial fibrillation is a big deal because number one is the most common arrhythmia in adults, and uh, is responsible for about 15, 20 percent of strokes. The incidence of strokes can be reduced when patients take blood thinners like Coumadin and Pradoxa. According to Teixeira, simple things like diet and over-the-counter medications can impact how much Coumadin an AFib patient needs to ingest. But the new medication Pradoxa doesn't work the same way as Coumadin, so it doesn't require the same level of monitoring in patients. It has a very different mechanism. Coumadin or warfarin uh, inhibits the use of vitamin K uh, that's essential for the production of uh, uh, coagulation factors. Uh, so in fact, if you put Coumadin on a test tube with blood, it does nothing. It does not thin the blood. Um, as opposed to uh, the new uh, anticoagulant, the, the bigger trial, Pradaxa, has a direct uh, anticoagulant effect, direct thrombin inhibitor. So if you put it in a test tube with blood, it will thin the blood. Because Pradaxa actually thins the blood in a different manner than warfarin, figuring the dosage and monitoring the patients taking Pradaxa looks to be a lot simpler. And the RELI study also showed that the risk of bleeding inside the brain, which is a possible side effect of blood thinning medications, was less with Pradoxa. The dose was approved in the U.S. by the FDA in October of 2010. It was more effective than Coumadin, with a less risk of intracranial bleeding. That it's the worst, more life-threatening uh, side effect you could have from anticoagulant. If you bleed inside the brain is not a good thing. Doctors, there's so much more that we need to explain about Pradoxa and Warfarin, and the, the big issue with this study is there's a little bit of cost difference between Coumadin and Pradoxa, right? Right. I mean, How much? A lot. Uh, of course, if you don't have to do pro times on a regular basis like you do with Warfarin, Pro times? Pro times is you check the blood. Uh, first time uh, you start them, you know, you check it before, and then you do it in four days, and then you do it in a week, and then you do it in two weeks, and then in three weeks, and then one month, every one month thereafter when you're starting people on warfarin. And um, that's spendy. But taking that into account, Pradaxa is twice as much 
as the whole cost of Warfarin. So it, uh, it, uh, it and it's brand new. Now is Warfarin one of those four dollar prescriptions a, that I can get? Yeah, a it's dirt pennies. How so much is a, a month? Two or three hundred dollars, I think, a month. Yeah, if you're paying cash, good. although you know you can say, well, I have insurance, and so somebody has to pay two three hundred. That okay. So what do you what do you sense about it? Um, well, it is a new drug, so we still need to gain uh, experience with it. Uh, sometimes you don't know that drugs have potential uh, hazards coming with them until you use them for years. With Coumadin, we know all the hazards, so we, we feel very comfortable managing patients with Coumadin. Um, a few problems are attached to Prodaxa. One is uh, it's cleared by the kidney, so if you have chronic kidney disease, you can't really be on that drug. Um, there's no way to monitor it safely. So we have this blood test for, for Coumadin, which has been around for decades. Uh, every laboratory can run the test, but no test to monitor you on Prodaxa. So you, you don't know how thin you are. Right. And they can, everybody must be different. Yeah, too. and all those patients on that study were healthy, fairly healthy people. And all the people in our practices uh, are usually uh, <laughs> o older patients who uh, don't fit the muster of these studies. So you have to be careful when you take data from studies and apply it to the real world okay. as with uh, any other treatment in medicine. And, and you don't know what the renal function of our elderly people are. I mean, they, so when they estimate the it, the kidney to... function is often uh, reduced as well. I will make this comment. Uh, Thank goodness for pharmaceutical industry for doing research and the way that they can do research and bring new uh, medicines. So we, I, my cynical side of me <laughs> needs to be held down a bit because we need to know new medicines and there's a time for that. This is a medicine that may have a great benefit for many, but right now it's early and it's expensive. And so it's not for everyone. So you're and not rushing out. With I'm not rushing out. Uh, and are you, are you using it much? Um, I use it in people who have good kidney function, they're young, uh, they uh, have trouble getting to the doctor to do an INR, the blood test we use to see how thin their blood is on Coumadin, uh, or people who, you know, just can't stand needles, they're willing to pay the extra cost, so, but they've got to have good kidney function and uh, usually you have to have good insurance coverage yeah. because it's expensive. It's expensive. Yeah. Okay. Now, Let's backtrack a little bit and just talk about blood and the, what are the different parts of blood and some of the, the basic school me and yeah Cameron what are the three basic groups and then we can divide them yeah so you know to make it simple really think of blood as a a, a river that's flowing with uh, the water in the river and uh, the rocks in the river and the fish in there so there's all kinds of different things in the blood. Uh, the water is what you would refer to as plasma if you separated all the different parts of the blood. Uh, and it's the, thickened. I mean, plasma is sort of like egg white yes, with, mixed with yeah, water. It's yeah. kind of thickened and it has, it has an ability to bring fluid in and bring fluid out. And I mean, it carries all sorts of things. It has a pur purpose. Absolutely, so that's one yeah. thing in blood that we don't count normally. Okay, what else? So uh, the, the easiest way to separate blood components is really to take the blood and spin it. Uh, that's called centrifugation. And uh, you then separate uh, the cells from the plasma and you can separate the cells further between the different uh, compartments of the cellular portion of the All blood. All right, so what kind of cells are within the cellular part? So the cell cellular part, part has uh, platelets, uh, mononuclear cells, which uh, usually are mostly white blood cells, and uh, red blood cells. So platelets, mononuclear cells, uh, uh, white, uh, other white cells, mm -hmm. and red cells. Yeah. What, about, uh, and what, are the, what are the red cells' primary function? So red blood cells are obviously what makes your blood red. So uh, that's the, that's, that's, that's the yeah. most important uh, thing to remember yeah. from tonight's uh, yeah. program. Uh, why are they red? Because they have a protein that carries oxygen. Uh, that's how you uh, bring oxygen to all the tissues in your body. And that protein is called hemoglobin. 
uh, hemoglobin um, uh, is inside the red blood cells and uh, when the red blood cells get to the lung they come in contact with oxygen from the air the oxygen goes into the red blood cell and uh, uh, binds to hemoglobin then the red blood cell carries that all the way into your body to to every single cell in our body exactly and it dumps the oxygen yeah. I mean, they're sort of like a claw made with iron, isn't yeah. that right? Yeah. And the claw opens up and dumps the, uh, uh, the oxygen when the oxygen's low on this side. Mm-hmm. So what about the, the, the monocytes? You were talking about mononuclear cells ver- yeah. versus the, the other kinds of white cells. Yeah. So mononuclear uh, is just really a fancy word for cell with one core. So... Uh, all the cells that have a core in, 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 uh, that is active and has DNA in it are called mononuclear cells. Red blood, red, red blood cells, for example, don't have DNA. They were, they were produced in the bone marrow just for the purpose of carrying oxygen, and uh, they don't divide, they don't do anything else other than uh, carrying three oxygen. Months, yeah. And then the spleen picks them up and dumps them. Yeah, and, you know, and the bone marrow is constantly making new ones to replace the ones that are being... Uh, taken out of circulation because they went past their expiration date. So mononuclear cells, you are including all kinds of white cells. Yeah. That's the white cells. Yeah, we, we, yeah, two parts of that group are really important, lymphocytes and uh, uh, granulocytes. Those are the two uh, white blood cell groups that you need to fight infections. Okay, so let's talk about the lymphocytes. They are the controllers, are they not? Yeah, they are, they are really the smart cells of the immune system. Some of them can live for decades inside your body. Uh, they have memory, so uh, you are immune to uh, chickenpox because you, for example, had chickenpox as a child. A few lymphocytes from back then are still in your body that remember the chickenpox ah, organism bad. and weren't going to let. And so they and when so, there is evidence so, of chickenpox coming. The smart cell says, I need to send the granulocytes or I need to send other lymphocytes to that and and fight off that infection. Absolutely, yeah. It's amazing. What else do the lymphocytes do? They make uh, antibody. Yeah, yeah. Lymphocytes, they they not only have memory, but they can differentiate into killer cells. They can uh, change, uh, which is what differentiation really means, the change into cells that produce antibodies. Then they're called plasma cells. Plasma cell um, antibodies can target all hosts of microbes that uh, invade your bloodstream. And uh, uh, the easiest way to think of an antibody is to think of a fork that's floating around in the body and binds to the microbe as it finds it. Finds the microbe, binds to it, and then it calls for help. In the, and then, then we're going to talk about granulocytes. Yeah. Let's talk about granulocytes. What are they? Those are... Um, just the, uh, I think of them uh, of less smart uh, immune system cells uh, that have a, a really big muscle. So what they do is they don't live as long. They have to be constantly renewed, so they have to be made uh, on a constant basis. But they they can really get into a, uh, an infection site and clean up things, uh, uh, and they usually die. They, they, so they, they're sort of the Harakiri uh, Harry immune Kari, system. Harry Harry <laughs> uh, uh, warrior yeah. that that finds the fork. Does it follow the fork? Uh, it can. It can. The fork can aid it in as far as where it needs to go. But usually they uh, they are uh, directed by the lymphocytes, uh, which communicate with them with different substances that they produce to get to the infection and clean out the area so, it, it, and it, sacrifice themselves uh, at yeah. the same time. So a, 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 And AIDS. AIDS is an infection that involves the smart cell, doesn't it? Exactly. And that's why it's so powerfully dangerous. Absolutely. So Each uh, of these different kinds of cells can have problems and it's and a we different disease. And we haven't and said different... anything about thrombocytes or the platelets. Say a few words about platelets. Platelets are uh, disc-shaped cells that uh, are produced in the bone marrow, then shipped out into the bloodstream. In the bloodstream, as long as they're in the shape of a disc, they can freely flow with the blood and basically just go along with what's happening. When there's injury to a blood vessel, 
uh, platelets get activated. They get the signal that they need to plug a hole in the blood vessel wall and when they activate they change their shape and they, when they change their shape other platelets find out and do the same thing and once they uh, start forming a group of uh, platelets uh, abnormally shaped. That, that are abnormally shaped they, they start forming a what we call a clot and uh, that's how you plug the hole, stop bleeding and now platelets can be uh, sometimes activated in areas where you don't want them to be activated. If you have injury to a blood vessel, uh, for example, in your heart from uh, a plaque that broke loose, or, uh, uh, and if, if, if that blood vessel is then closed off by the activated platelets, you can have a heart attack. It's a heart attack. So, so it's, it's a really fine balance. Now, we, we were talking about blood thinning earlier, and it's interesting. We were talking about warfarin. We're talking about this new drug, but platelets are countered not by that. That particular clotting mechanism is countered by what medication? Aspirin. Aspirin. And so, so a baby aspirin a day primarily thins the blood by affecting those platelets. Right. Yeah. But, but it's three different ways that these work. The aspirin does, does the, thins it one way, warfarin thins it another way, yeah. Pradaxa thins it another way. Well, Pradaxa thin, thins it another And there's another way uh, using heparin or uh, heparin-like medications. Okay. That's it, it's so it's yeah. a complex story. Yeah. We're getting we're getting more confusing, aren't we? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm going to let's jump into. Some yeah. Well, let's just, just think okay. of a few things. Uh, to form a clot, you need the platelet to change its shape. You need coagulation factors, which Dr. Tischer talked about. Uh, those are made in the liver. They're proteins that uh, kind of make that clot form. Uh, uh, the cement in between the platelets, so that plugs really uh, uh, closed off. The platelet gets it started and the cement comes the, the in. The cement comes it. in, exactly. What aspirin does is it prevents the platelets from forming the clot. Uh, what Coumadin and uh, Pradoxa do is uh, keeping the cement from filling in, uh, so to say. Uh, they work by different mechanisms. Uh, Pradoxa works right at the site of uh, Platelet aggregation and clot formation. Uh, warfarin works at the liver. Level. In the liver, exactly. So warfarin uh, is decreasing the amount of factors in the bloodstream that that, that the help, liver's making. That the liver makes exactly. Okay. Well, I'm just going to abruptly change the course of the conversation. We'll dive into questions now. Um, a caller, age 36, from Sioux Falls. She has a clotting disorder called Factor V. Um, and she's been told that there's really only one vascular medicine doctor in Sioux Falls. She's wondering what does she do when this doctor retires. So what is factor five? And it looks like there's, um, I, I'm not going to attempt yeah, to factor pronounce Factor five Leiden, that. yeah. So that's a mutation. What's a mutation? A mutation is a gene that's uh, been copied abnormally. Factor five is one of these factors produced in the liver that makes your blood thick, and you need to form that cement to plug the hole. Right. Okay. And, and it's an inherited abnormality as opposed to an acquired. So there's two types of blood clotting disorders that we need to address. But the one inherited is this factor V Leiden. Now, why would she have a problem? Where is this Leiden story? Well, uh, the Leiden story is that her factor V is not the normal factor V that people without the, this mutation are making. So it's a factor five that causes too much clotting. So they don't, she doesn't have a problem plugging the hole. Her factor five does too good of a job plugging the hole. So she can form blood clots uh, without uh, uh, an injury that she needs to repair. So she is at risk for blood clots in, in her legs, in the veins in the legs, or even uh, on the arterial side, potentially, but this is more of a problem on the venous side, uh, at least in my practice. And now, it, it, is important, for... it is important to distinguish between people who have one mutation or two mutations. So you get two copies of this gene, one from your father, one from your mother. And uh, some people can have two abnormal copies, which is rare, but if that happens, uh, you are at much higher mm -hmm. risk for blood clots and uh, 
the, the folks who have at least one normal gene. Now, if this person, if you went across the board and you studied 100,000 people, you'd find a lot of people living a normal life, Absolutely. normal factor, I mean, uh, with this abnormality. Yeah. Do you treat them? No. Leave them alone? So, yes. So the thing with factor V Leiden is that in some populations, up to 20% of people may carry the one mutation, and they're getting by just fine with one normal gene. So they're making enough normal factor V to uh, not have a clotting problem. And the fact that it's so common is because uh, there was probably somebody in Northern Europe about 20,000 years ago <laughs> who made the mistake of copying their factor V uh, uh, in the abnormal way, which happened to work out great for him, because at the time, people were more into fighting with the sword, and bleeding was more of a problem than clotting. <laughs> gave them an so, advantage. So that Survival person advantage somehow for... did much better than all the other yeah. guys, no. so passed his Pass genes <laughs> to lots of offspring. Yeah, <laughs> now my question is, uh, this person obviously has a clotting abnormality because she's been discovered. She knows she's got it, and she's probably had blood clots to her legs and to her lungs, and now she is being treated with what medicine? Takes us back to uh, Coumadin. Right now, the only uh, approved treatment is Coumadin or Warfarin. Uh, Prodaxa has not been approved for that indication yet, but the drug companies uh, are working on it. making Prodaxa and similar compounds are working on it. Now, uh, Coumadin works well uh, if, pa if patients uh, have factor V Leiden, if they have two abnormal genes, I usually recommend lifelong anticoagulation. But if they have one abnormal gene uh, uh, and they had one blood clot once, we, we try to take them off warfarin or Coumadin uh, if there was a good uh, reason for them having the clot at the time, which usually includes having been on oral contraception pills because estrogens can increase your chance of having blood clots or smoking pre or pregnancy, pregnancy. Now, we have we've got to move on but the gist of her question she when her doctor retires who does she look to to continue well, treatment like Cameron or others there are uh, you know there Looking are what five or six in Sioux Falls there are she, other doctors in other towns yeah, yes she I mean if you <coughs> if you have factor five Leiden uh, I think uh, you should at least see a hematologist once who's knowledgeable about the disease. Uh, it's important to distinguish between one or two abnormal genes. It's important to make sure you don't have any other clotting problems because there are other clotting di uh, disorders that can coexist in this, these patients and uh, uh, increase their risk of blood clots in addition to having factor V blood. But most okay. of these well, come we, back to their primary care doctor. Yeah, eventually we, we anyway, don't they? Yep. Keep moving on here. We'll now, on. Much of today's medical care depends on a steady and safe supply of blood, and that blood comes from volunteers, people who actually save lives by simply spending a fraction of their day donating blood. On Call visited the Community Blood Bank Bloodmobile, which is based in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, during its recent trip to Brookings. We wanted to learn more about the importance of donating blood, and On Call's Frederick Cohn has this story. In any given year, four and a half million American lives are saved through blood transfusions. Ken Versteeg, executive director of the Community Blood Bank, explains the mission of the Blood Mobile. Our main mission is to provide a safe and adequate blood supply to the communities that we service. We're kind of a co-op and in the sense that um, the communities that we service, we come and do blood drives. We're in Brookings actually twice a month uh, doing blood drives. And when they come to, um, to the blood bank, or to the blood drive here in Brookings, they're basically um, providing blood to their own hospital. Um, everything that's donated here in Brookings comes back to Brookings and stays here in Brookings. There are few restrictions on blood donation eligibility. Generally, donors just need to be healthy and of age. The process of donating blood takes around a half an hour and it includes a short screening interview required by the FDA. And after that, they receive a little mini physical, which is their blood pressure, their pulse, their temperature, and her hematocrit, which is their iron count. Uh, if they pass all that, then they're able to donate one pint of blood. Uh, and one pint of blood will actually save three people's lives. Because once we donate that pint of blood, once they donate that pint of blood, it goes back to the hospital and it's separated into platelets, plasma, and red blood cells. Those 
those three components. And those three components will be transfused to three individuals in the hospital. Blood donors can offer this valuable gift on a regular basis. It's amazing, isn't it? Just rolling up your sleeve. It's a regenerated, uh, it's, it's regenerable for your body. I mean, you're able to replenish it. So you just, every 56 days, a person could save three lives. It's an amazing thing. And this time of year is an especially important season for potential donors to think about this amazing act. Usually we see a decrease of about 20%, um, yeah. which is significant, especially when we rely upon about 550 units of blood to be donated a week in order for us to maintain an adequate blood supply for the 29 hospitals. So um, we kind of reach a point where in the summertime we have to uh, encourage people and remind people continually that the need is there. The need is consistently there. And even though it's summer, um, we ask that you not take a vacation on donating blood. Take the time to give life. Take the time to roll up your sleeve in 20 minutes of your time and, and give the gift of life. A blood transfusion is a safe, common procedure in which blood is given to you through an intravenous or IV line in one of your blood vessels. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're talking about blood and clotting disorders and here in the studio ready to answer your questions are Dr. Cameron Darabi and the on-call medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. Our phone lines are open and you can call in right now with your questions about t tonight's topic. Our phone number is 1-888-376-6225. Doctors, we've got a stack of questions here, but do you want to add anything else about blood, donating blood before we move on? Uh, they're down in the summer. It's time to donate. This should be the time that you should pick and say, okay, I'll donate, and summertime would be a good one. Uh, any other comment? You're the, you're the guru on blood banking. Especially if you're group O, make sure you're donating as much as you can because you are the universal donor. Anybody can be transfused group O red blood cells. No matter what blood group they have, they could have A, B, or AB. And they can get the O. Whereas if you have A, the A could cause problems with the person who's a B, or the A could cause problems with the person who's an O. But if you're an O, you don't have, it's like you don't have the antigen that causes problems in this other group. Is that a good explanation? Uh, absolutely. And, and if you're O, you can only get O. So it's, uh, you're helping the other folks with blood group O. And that's important because only 15% of people are, are blood group O, so it's rare. So all you O's out there, <laughs> come on in. You're very <laughs> special. You're yeah. special. How healthy does somebody have to be to give blood? Cause it, I, you have to weigh more than you weigh 10. I, I think you have to weigh a certain amount. Yeah. Yeah, it's and you, 110 pounds. Yeah. I just checked today, and you know these things change all Are the you time. 110 pounds? Um, you don't want to say. I don't want to say on air, but uh, <laughs> no. I, I'm kind of off the hook. Yeah. yeah. So, but uh, I, you, you know, they test your blood for all kinds of illnesses. It's the safest, uh, I often say to people, the blood that's from South Dakota is probably the safest blood in the world. You know, it's safer uh, or as safe as maybe two or three other states in this country, but the rest are, high, are, are not quite as, or there are higher risk populations that donate the blood. This is the lowest risk po uh, uh, blood donators. And if you look at the rest of the world, this is definitely the safest. I mean, am I wrong in saying that? Uh, yeah, I think the blood supply in the U.S. is very safe. Um, patients are screened, and that's what um, was mentioned in the, in the clip. Uh, just the questions do a great job at screening out people who shouldn't be giving blood. Uh, aside from the questions, you have uh, sophisticated laboratory tests now that can uh, pick up infections such as HIV, hepatitis B, and C, and uh, the chance of getting HIV or hepatitis from a blood donation is really low. It's probably less, you know, there's probably one infection in every one to two or three million transfusions. So and those the people receiving. Yeah, so, you know, if we transfused maybe two million people, one person potentially could get an infection like that. That's very, very low. And uh, it can only happen because people. that person who donated the infected blood got infected just before they donated blood. So the test wasn't able to pick that up right. yet. Are there any risks to giving blood? Cool. There's no risks. I mean, you're not taking any blood. There's absolutely no risk. Give me the hard sell on why I should do it. Well, the reason you should do it is people need it. 
and, and it isn't going to hurt you, and it's going to help people. I mean, the, the pain of it is your fear. It? It's the fear is all that is. And let go of that fear and, and give to uh, the people who are in need. Would you say anything more, Ken? Um, well, uh, I think healthy people can uh, uh, really look uh, at this as a way in giving back to the community. And uh, uh, it's certainly of no harm to them. Uh, and... Uh, uh, it, it, it'll be helping uh, helping out a lot of people who need yeah. need their uh, blood product donation. You you return your by uh, by a week, you have all your red cells back. That your body come back, and in within a you know six or eight hours, you've got all your volume back. I will say that I went jogging right after donating one blood one time. <laughs> yeah. My bottom was dragging on the ground. <laughs> I I only ran three, not six, and I thought, whoo. Boy, what, did, what what's wrong? Oh, I forgot I donated but you blood. Good enough to go, just get back. Go for a run. I mean, you know, but um, I could feel it. Okay. I went for a run though two days later, and I was fine. All right. Well, we better dive into the questions here. Uh, caller from Sioux Falls: Red spots under the skin looks like bruises. Sees them on old on an old person. Can anything be done about it? That could be a lot of things. Yeah, I have to answer this because this is really my area. I take care of all these older people, and I put many of them on an aspirin a day because there's data about prevention of colon polyps as well as uh, some data to say that it prevents strokes and heart attacks in asymptomatic people. But if you've had heart disease or if you've had strokes or you've had TIAs, there's solid data on it. So I have a lot of people on aspirin. Well, what happens? They have bruises, an easy bruisability. Well, what if I don't have them on aspirin? If you're older, you have easy bruisability and bruise marks, and it looks like they're, you know, they're dying and they've got terrible bruises and so on and so forth. And if you, I check them, then their white count's normal, their platelets are normal, their, their hematocrit and hemoglobin are normal, and there's no problem. It's just part of getting older. So for the most part, you know, if you're seeing your doctor on a regular basis and you're on an aspirin, it's very common. And, you know, it might be worth one check to make sure that your blood parts are normal. Would you add to that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, could, uh, you could have uh, platelets not working right, not enough of them. Blood could be too thin. We talked about all the issues about blood too thick. Now, if you're too thin, you could bruise easily. Uh, it is important to uh, make sure uh, it's not a skin condition because that can uh, look sometimes just like bruises and uh, uh, obviously in our area uh, skin cancer can be of a concern so you know if you have just a few spots uh, and your family doctor is uh, not concerned uh, you, you don't need to pursue that further but uh, anybody here should really see a dermatologist probably once a year for a skin check, especially as they get older, because the incidence, uh, the rate of uh, skin cancer is so high in uh, Caucasian populations who, who, who work outside a lot. Yeah. 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 Okay. Or your primary care doctor. I mean, and, and, and we send people to the dermatologist all the time, so it's important you get it looked at. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, a question from Howard, a gentleman has multiple myeloma. It's fairly rare. Why don't I hear as much about it as the other cancers? Is research being done on it? Yeah. So explain what multiple myeloma is. You know, we explained the different kinds of white cells, and you explained the plasma cell, which was one of those lymphocytes that makes a makes antibody uh, uh, to fight infection. What's multiple myeloma? So um, we talked about lymphocytes. Lymphocytes can turn into plasma cells to make antibodies when there's an infection where you need antibody production. Uh, Plasma cells can become cancerous. When that happens, uh, it's usually called multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma um, uh, can cause a number of problems. The biggest problem is too many antibodies in your bloodstream can cause uh, renal failure, can cause kidney failure, uh, can cause uh, clotting, uh, can cause... Uh, Nerve damage, damage to the heart, and other organs. Uh, 
the plasma cells like to grow in the bone. That's where they, they, they multiply and increase their numbers uh, when, when they become cancerous in multiple, multiple myeloma. Uh, that can cause destruction of the bone and can even cause fractures. So are we more successful in treating multiple myeloma nowadays? I know that in the older days, we really didn't have anything that effectively changed more mortality. In other words, people still died from it. And we, we treated the symptoms by keeping the blood uh, proteins down. But we didn't have good therapy back when I was going through training. What do we have now? Well, just in the last 10 years, uh amazing progress has been made for multiple myeloma patients. About 10 years ago or so, the average survival of a patient diagnosed with multiple myeloma was about two to three years. And this included even patients receiving uh, autologous bone marrow transplants. So a very heavy dose of chemo, toxic treatment uh, at a high cost. Now in the last 10 years, a number of drugs, at least four or five new drugs have come to market which have shifted the average survival from two to three to six to seven years. So, and that's average. In other words, some people can live way past that. Oh, yeah. So it's a, it's a uh, huge difference. What is the main drug that we're using on that? Uh, the two drugs I use in most patients these days are two of the new drugs that I talked about. One of them is called uh, Revlimid or lenalidomide. The other one is called uh, Velcade. Uh, we use a very old drug with these two, which works excellently together with them. It's called dexamethasone. It's a simple steroid pill, costs pennies, uh, has been around for ages. Okay. Um, we're going to go back to warfarin. A uh, caller from Leola, female caller, age 85. Um, her, she's on warfarin. Her dosage, it's a 10. Cut in half, she takes a blue one. And uh, blue, one warfarin, four milligram. Take one every day. Um, can she take aspirin instead? I think is the gist of this. Are you, you know, here's my answer. Is, it, and her, is her dose too much? I, I missed the diagnosis, sorry. We don't have the diagnosis. Oh, She's okay. on warfarin for some reason or other. Can she take aspirin? And it depends upon the diagnosis. You're shaking your head. Yeah, it depends. So it's very important to get the message out that aspirin does not protect you uh, against venous blood clots. Okay, what, what yeah, clots blood clots are, uh, that, that aspirin works are in the arteries. Okay. So, for example, a heart attack is in the arteries. That's sending blood out to the cells. When the blood is coming back to the heart to, to get reoxygenated, the that's veins. venous system. The veins in the legs or the big varicose veins, that's coming back. That, that's where aspirin doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And that's where Coumadin's needed. And that's the kind of problem that people have who are on Coumadin is big clots in their legs and oftentimes clots that can occur within the wall, uh, within the heart, not in the arteries of the heart, and uh, can flip to the lungs. So, so we, there are two points you need to be made. One is that you don't dump the warfarin and just take aspirin. Um, can you take aspirin and warfarin together if you have coronary artery disease and you have blood clots to the leg? Yeah, there are some uh, high-risk patients that are taking both. Uh, obviously, your risk of having a significant bleed is much higher when you on aspirin and Coumadin. So your Coumadin uh, has to be monitored really closely. You have to be aware of the foods that interact with Coumadin. So let's talk about the yeah. foods yeah, that important. interact with Coumadin. So the way Coumadin works is it's a, an inhibitor of vitamin K, uh, carboxylation. What, what, what that really means is vitamin K is coming in through the diet. Coumadin blocks your liver from producing the coagulation factors that need vitamin K in their structure to function properly. So the lack of those factors makes your blood thin. So what kind of uh, things in your diet which will adjust this uh, vitamin K has a lot of K or no K? Well, uh, a rule of thumb would be to remember that anything green and leafy has lots of vitamin K. Uh, usually, I tell my patients to watch out for salad, broccoli, things like that. Um, they have a lot of vitamin K. So what that means is uh, you will need more Coumadin to thin your blood. 
when if you're taking you, a lot of leafy greens. Yes. My answer is, I love leafy greens for you. You need to do those vegetables. Have it consistently all the time. I'm adjusting your warfarin dose. Be consistent. Don't just eat tons of it in the summer and then none in the winter. I mean, you, you know, we, we live in a, a diet uh, rich uh, Absolutely. environment. Yeah. Same amount every day. Yeah. Same amount different. every day. Then you can have it. Obviously, it's an important part of the diet. And uh, uh, just don't fluctuate. You know, don't have a ton of it the day before you go and get your blood drawn yeah. at the doctor's <laughs> office because you're, gonna, you're going to mislead the doctor into giving you too much Coumadin for the next week yeah. where you're not going to eat enough vitamin K. So your blood will be too thin and you'll be at risk for bleeding. Right. Okay. And the right dose is really depends upon the person. There's no question about realizing how variable people are uh, by, by treating people with uh, Coumadin. I've had little ladies who are tiny little wisps of people, kind of like you, yeah. Tammy, <laughs> who take 10 milligrams of Coumadin every day. And then I've had big robust men who take two and a half or five, you know, every day or lower. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a variable deal and it can vary in the season even though they're trying to be consistent with their diet. So it's, you've got, you're, you're, you just have to continue to monitor. You just can't get a dose and then forget the doctor. You need to check every four to six weeks, max six weeks. Okay. Um, hopefully you can answer this question with a yes or a no. Caller from Spe Spearfish, 66-year-old female. If I've had shingles, can I give blood? I don't think that's an exclusion at this time. How about uh, uh, Obviously, you don't want to donate it when you have active zoster. Yeah, wait until um, you're well, and then you can. Yeah, uh, yeah. So what about uh, a, a tattoo? Uh, I think in the past that used to be an issue, but uh, I'm not aware of that being a problem right now. Obviously, the concern there is that uh, somebody who had a tattoo may be at a slightly higher risk for blood-borne infection like hepatitis. hepatitis but I don't think that's a problem right now. Uh, you will get your blood will get screened for HIV or hepatitis anyway. So I personally don't. Uh, I'm not aware of that being an issue right now, uh, and. When I uh, emailed our blood bank director uh, a couple of days ago, uh, I, I, she didn't email me anything, anything about, about tattoos. I thought there was a, like, if you've had a tattoo, you've got to wait six months or a year or something before you can get a... Yeah, there, there could be a rule like that in place. I, uh, I, have, to, I have to double check on All that. Right. I'm okay. not sure. Okay. A question from Huron. Uh, male, oh, we're going to have to be quick on this. Lipoprotein A causes strokes and heart attacks. He is um, it's talking about, he's got some numeral measurements here. He's 149, daughter is 115. Um, uh, listen, let me, let me quickly say this. Yeah. That's one of the lipid studies that people are uh, glomming onto and saying this is an important indicator for heart disease and that you can adjust these by taking lipid-lowering drugs. My personal bias is there's a lot of doctors who feel otherwise, but I, I will give you my bias. The data is not in yet. The science that says that a person who's not had a heart attack, even though we know these are indicators of higher risk, slightly higher risk or somewhat higher risk of heart disease, we don't have data to say that lowering them changes things or raising them changes things. We just know they're indicators. Uh, it's uh, the same as cholesterol. Cholesterol risk factor is a risk factor for heart disease. If you've not had a heart attack, it's a risk factor, but uh, lowering it, we don't have data to say it makes a difference. So we're at the end of our yeah, time. We need you got to any final words of wisdom? Uh, yeah, take home messages. Well, take, I think there's two take home messages. Um, uh, if you are on Coumadin, learn about the diet. Uh, requirements that you need to be aware of. Um, uh, know that there's new drugs coming to market that could be a uh, uh, potential treatment for you if you've had trouble on Coumadin. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, the other message would be that uh, aspirin, aspirin is important in treating heart disease and strokes, but... Uh, be careful with them. Yeah, be careful if you're on both and uh, make sure you monitor frequently uh, as far as your INR goes, yeah. which is the blood test for Coumadin monitoring. And my take is thanks for joining us and don't forget to exercise out there, people. <laughs> thanks, doctors. Hang on, we will be right back after the break with the Homespun Perspective and then what's new in medical science. 
Looking for reliable healthcare information online? You can start with a resources link at the OnCall website. From there, you can access a variety of accurate and dependable information sources, including the South Dakota State Department of Health and Medline Plus. I remember when leukemia was a diagnosis of doom. I was an intern on the oncology ward in Atlanta some 35 years ago where a lovely, strong, and very positive 40-something woman was living with the disease. She was making it month by month from each chemotherapy session to the next and was proud how she had survived longer than the average acute leukemia patient. Sadly, I remember one day after we left her side, our teacher, an oncologist, told us compassionately that her sick white blood cells were developing resistance to our best medicines and that the end was soon to come. We provided comfort until she died. This experience stands in stark contrast to that of another 40-ish female patient of mine who had the same diagnosis 20 years later and who was cured of the disease. She lives a completely normal life now with her sister's transplanted bone marrow, which churns out the red and white cells and the platelets of her blood. There are three lessons I see from both stories. First, over the 20 years after the death of the first woman, hundreds of physician scientists collaborated and treated hundreds and thousands of patients with leukemia, discovering, testing, refining with the scientific method so as to save the life of the second woman. Next, to be alive is to be at risk for suffering. Sometimes there is no cure and nothing is left to do except to provide comfort medicines and emotional support. Finally, it is honest scientific research that brings us real hope. Hope for more wellness, hope for more relief from suffering, and hope for even more cures for the future. We'll be right back. Before we get to our medical science, a real quick question Dr. Holm wanted to respond to. Can you give Right hand doesn't work right, has been, not been to the doctor, uh, I'm having pain. Really get in to see your doctor, please. It could be a little stroke. This might be something you need to be on aspirin. Maybe you need something more, so get on in and see your doctor, please, please, please. Okay, we'll keep on trucking now. In our medical news tonight, a recent study by scientists at the University of Chicago examined how discussions about faith and spirituality affected hospital patient satisfaction. Data was collected between January of 2006 and June of 2009, and over 3,000 patients were involved. Study authors looked at whether or not patients wanted to have religious and spiritual concerns addressed while in the hospital, and whether or not anyone talked to them and actually did address these issues during their hospital stay. What the authors found out is that 41% of the patients involved in the study wanted to discuss religious or spiritual concerns, and 32% of the patients in the study said these discussions did occur. The study also examined whether or not talking about spiritual issues affected overall patient satisfaction, and it appears that it did, even if patients didn't want to talk about these things. Even those who did not want a conversation about spiritual issues ranked their satisfaction with their care higher than those who did not discuss spiritual issues in the hospital. And in other news, Caring.com is a commercial website that provides information for caregivers. And in a recent media release, they bring up some information that can be useful for you during the hot summer days just ahead. Older individuals frequently can't handle hot weather as well as younger people can, and seniors are at a higher risk for problems like heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Dehydration can also be a problem. If you are a senior, and even if you're not, think about things like staying hydrated and avoiding the sun. Drink plenty of water and avoid alcohol and caffeine, caffeine drinks that work against staying hydrated. Limit the time you spend in direct sunlight and wear a hat and sunscreen when you need to go out. And importantly, know how to use the air conditioner and electric fans. If this coming weekend is anything like last weekend, it's not time to be stingy with your air cooling budget. Don't overdress. Sometimes seniors can't tell if they're too hot and they wear long pants and layers out of habit. 
and perhaps most importantly, keep an eye out for each other. Visit or check on elders that might need help during the heat. And if you do all that, we will be sure to visit with you again next week. So to wrap up tonight, a reminder, we'll rebroadcast on SDPB Digital Channel 2, Mondays at 11 a.m. Central and Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Central. Once more, I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Cameron Durabi, and the on-call medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. Thanks to our phone volunteers, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. Have a good evening. Funding for this program is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. To learn more about life and health, you can order your copy of The Picture of Health, a beautiful book containing insightful essays and evocative images by on-call medical editor Dr. Rick Holm and Dr. Judith Peterson. This book, containing health care advice, stories of medical history, and meditations on healing, can now be yours for $17 at the South Dakota Ag Heritage Museum. Call 1-877-227-0015 to order. This offer is made by Ag Biocommunications at South Dakota State University.